Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Communications and Cigars. I'm your host, John Crook. Thank you for tuning in this evening. We got kind of an interesting um, episode for tonight, and obviously it's called Prevalent P25. That's right. We dive into a little bit of the history and understanding of the P25 digital voice technology. Now, if you remember about a year or so ago, we did demystifying DMR, where we kind of talked and delved into, for the most part, DMR in, in kind of in a general aspect of things of so saying like, okay, what is DMR? The different, you know, where DMR came from is kind of the standard, what types of forms of DMR out there, you know, such as tier one, tier two, all that kind of stuff like that on there. And we, you know, it, it came up as we were like, man, we never continued on that series. So we said, okay, let's do it. Let's do the series here. Now we'll be moving into P25. And that's what tonight's episode of Prevalent P25 is all about. But first of all, thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, it's great to have all the viewers and stuff that we do have coming in. Um, have been getting some emails and comments from people lately. On some of the shows that we were doing in the past, um, I know we have a few that we need to get caught up on from the last episode and stuff like that. So we will be probably be doing that kind of coming up here pretty soon. But of course, as the show states, it is communications and cigars. And if you ever have questions about the show, ha- want to like, hey, I, you know, have this for an idea, do that kind of thing like that. By all means, go ahead and send me an email. And that email address is communications-cigars at jjkcom.com. Once again, communications-cigars at jjkcom.com. That's right. JJK Communications is a proud sponsor of of our show and that's where we can kind of get all the equipment and all this kind of fun stuff to be able to go ahead and do that on there plus also too is it helps us go ahead and in essence provide kind of somewhat of a um, educational standpoint plus also too is we then don't have to ask for people to send in money or sponsors or anything like that whatsoever so with that and without do let's talk about prevalent P25. So exactly what is P25? Well, it's another digital voice standard that's out there. And when I say a digital voice standard, I, I truly mean a digital voice standard. Okay. There are different types of digital voice technologies out there that serve different purposes. Okay. And as I've said before in the past and everything, we're never going to be one digital voice standard. We're not. There, there's no way it's going to do it. I mean, it's just not going to happen. And each digital voice technology comes to, in essence, the the table comes to the purpose or whatever for a specific purpose that's on there. And when we talk about P25 tonight, you're going to see where P25 came from, the origins and stuff like that on there, which is really going to kind of make sense to, to kind of put it together as to why things are. But before we can start getting into the aspects of talking about p25 and it there we do need to understand some of the basics so like we did with our demystifying dmr we're going to be doing this here with p25 and understanding because this is going to play a very significant part in here so when we're talking about the frequencies tonight because that's a bandwidth and, and digital modes and stuff like that we have to take a look at how things work on the system here okay so in our understanding of the basics we're going to be talking about frequency we're going to use that road analogy and like i said i i love using this road analogy to help explain it to people but if we take a look at this four lane highway if we say from the yellow line to the yellow line is 25 kilohertz of bandwidth that is what we were at before but now with digital voice, we can start to get more narrower and narrower. We can start to put more frequencies in crowded spectrum. We can start to do more with 
that digital signal that includes our voice than we could with just an analog audio signal only. So in this case, if we take a look at it right here, here we go. We have this, which is, like I said, understanding the basics and the yellow line to the yellow line. That is 25 kilohertz of bandwidth. Now, what we need to do is we need to now cough it up and go ahead and sing like, wait a minute here. But the advantage to digital is going to be basically saying we can use half that frequency space. So we don't need the full 25 anymore. We can go ahead and we can do 12 and a half kilohertz of bandwidth. So now that 25 kilohertz analog only channel now is one channel and one channel. So if we take a look at this road right through that center line, you have one voice path, you have another voice path on there. But as you'll see when we talk about the different phases of P25, you're going to see that P25 also has the ability in the next phase or phase two of breaking it down even further. So now not only are we not using the whole roadway, not only are we not using just half of the roadway, we are actually using four individual lanes, which will present voice and data of that digital nature in there. Don't worry about it. You're not going to get lost here tonight. We'll walk through you step by step by step. But tonight is going to be pretty uh, need a basis of this understanding to show how P25 actually goes ahead and works and why there's a phase one and a phase two on there. So let's talk about the origins of P25. Now, P25, without a doubt, is a public safety standard and design. Okay. Totally there. The P of P25 comes from APCO, to, um, and, and it's an APCO standard. So APCO, as you see, the first one, the Association of Public Safety Communication Officials International. Okay, that's what APCO stands for. APCO has come up with standards. They actually had a standard before called the P16 on there, which basically kind of gave some def definitions of trunking and stuff like that on there. But what APCO does, what all these organizations did in this case, is they got together, and, and actually, surprisingly, they got together in like the mid to, mid to late 80s, really, is what it was. And they said, okay, we are currently using analog technology. All right. Now, this is, excuse me, we're talking 80s. We're talking Dukes of Hazard, Knight Rider, you know. Um, a majority of us probably still watching Saturday morning cartoons and stuff like that on there. But it, what it was, was as they said, our, our technology is evolving, right? Voice technology is evolving. And there was really no digital voice at this time. And they said, as we move forward, we need to create better communications. And digital was being eyed as the future. And that's really what it was. Now, this wasn't a standard of a, of a of a company right i hear so many people there's one person i know that lives over in minnesota like apco is a motorola standard no it's not a motorola standard in any way shape or form okay what p25 is it, it is a standard that was developed with these agencies that you see here now motorola yes was quick to adopt it but there are other manufacturers of p25 equipment that are out there but you do see some of the lists here. APCO, the Association of Public Safety Communication Officials, okay? NASTD, the National Association of State Telecommunications Directors. Then you have NTIA. Some of you may hear NTIA if you're familiar with that stuff. And that's the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, okay? The NCS, the National Communications System. The NSA, the National Security Agency, and the DOD, the Department of Defense. They are all kind of said, you know what, we need to come up with communications that is going to take us into that next generation. Digital was decided on, and that's where they went along and they said, we're going to come up with the standard. But it wasn't just these government agencies, these uh, government organizations, these go agencies or organizations associated with the government, they took and they said, we need to get stakeholders involved. So what they did is they said in committee with the following agencies. So they said, okay, here we go. Let we're, we're talking about this here as organizations, but we're going to bring you in 
Okay, you may not be an organization that's going to be involved in this, but you're going to be one that probably is going to be using this and it's going to go forward. So let's bring you in as it. And then you see the Department of Homeland Security the FPIC division, which is the Federal Partnership for Interoperability Comms. Okay, makes sense. The Coast Guard which also makes sense, the Department of Commerce NIST division, which is the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, and then finally, the Office of Law Enforcement Standards. These are agencies which weren't in the design or aspect of it like they were in there, but they said, come on in, join our group. We're going to be talking about this. Now, as you see, why would these committees or committee folk be brought into this whole thing? Well, once again, APCO is being designed for public safety usage, all righty? So why not go ahead and have a representation of, A, people who, i.e. APCO and NASTD and, and stuff, why not have them that are going to have to use it, why not let them have a say and get in on manufacturing, this, or not manufacturing, excuse me, but the standards for manufacturing, OK, the NTIA, the NSC or NCS. OK, those were agencies that are saying, OK, now we're dealing with maybe communications in sort of a regulatory fashion or how we can use them properly, those kind of things. And then now you actually had federal users which were going to be needing to use these communications. OK, now I want to mind um, I want to point out a big misconception that kind of came out about it. Lots of people think that 9-11 was the birth of really P-25. And as you see already here, that's not the case. P-25 really started to come into a prevalent, uh, okay, of P-25 usage in the mid-90s, all righty? Many places really started to experiment. I know of places that really about 1996... Um, some agencies started to play with P-25. Now, prior to P-25, there were manufacturing variants of, quote-unquote, digital voice, i.e. Motorola with their V-SLEP, okay? Now, they, as a quote-unquote, called Astro, which then kind of the term Astro kind of merged into P-25, and they got rid of V-SLEP. But other places had a form of digital or a, a aspect of what, sort of digital would be like, but there was nothing that said, hey, here's the standard on there. But this is where they started to say, we got to figure it out. We got to do it. We got to do it now. And I think that plays a good part because what you did is you didn't have a manufacturer leading the route, right? You didn't have a aspect of saying this and this, but better yet, P25 was designed within the U.S. for public safety usage within the U.S., now, it wasn't only designed to be just public safety. It was designed to be a digital voice mode that, in essence, would be able to use by public safety, would be able to use by NGO, non-government organizations, would be able to be used by government strategic partners or sometimes GSPs. OK, these were saying, saying, OK, hey, listen, you are this company, you are this, 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 whatever. OK, good example, the power company up here. OK, um, XL Energy, and it's not up here, but it's like kind of like they're through the northern part of the U.S. on there. They use a large P25 network on there because they needed reliable communications. They wanted a digital standard. And that's what they went with. Right. Obviously, an electric company is not a government organization, but they did that for that basic and understanding of purpose. Now, when they all got together and came up with the P25 standards purpose, they wanted to initially create what they call a CAI. That CAI stands for Common Air Interface for Digital Voice Usage. What they were saying is instead of saying we're going to have Motorola come up with it, we're going to have EF Johnson, we're going to have Kenwood, we're going to have whoever come up with this, and then we're going to adopt to it. No, it was the other way around. They said, this is the standard you're going to go ahead and present. That way, what it did is, in essence, leveled the playing field. All righty. If we look like how DMR was, DMR was Etsy standard, but that was for certain operations. But then they went along and a lot of places came and said, OK, no, we're going to call it this, which is DMR, but we add this little thing to it for us. And we do this and this and this. No, 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 no. 
In this case, they said, if you're going to produce what we call a P25 radio, an APCO 25 compliant radio that has to have a common air interface. So if I pick up a P25 radio that's a certified P25 radio from Motorola and I take an EF Johnson and I take a Kenwood and I take a Tate or I take a Harris and we put it on that channel and we're all programmed the same way we are going and same band same everything we are going to be able to hear one another if your radio cannot hear the other quote unquote P25 people then your radio is not following the common air interface standard or they are not following the common face or common air interface standard. So that was the biggest thing that they had to do. What this did is it really kind of broke free of this molding of saying, okay, you know what? If we want to use this technology, we can only use Motorola. Or if we want to use the technology, we can only use EF Johnson. No, it, it allowed the users of it. The next part they did is it defined the use of the voice codec. Okay. There were two voice codecs through the history of P25. The first one was the IMBE, so the Improved Multiband Excitation. That was the first one that was out there and really can only be used by Phase 1. We'll get into that in a little bit here. All righty. Now as we've developed and the IMBE vocoder has grown a little long in the tooth, they've now moved over to the AMBE Plus 2 vocoder. So it's an improved vocoder. It allows... And you're going to hear a lot with AMBE if you get into that kind of thing. AMBE really handles DMR and other things pretty well. Um, but the AMBE is backwards compatible to the voice modes that were used by IMBE. So AMBE plus two is, is a lot better than IMBE. So that's that's kind of where that whole thing kind of sat on there. What does it mean? Does it mean that if you have an IMBE radio, you can't talk to an AMBE plus two radio? No, not at all. What it means is, is that um, IMBE is going to be a little more constrictive and probably will not be able to be upgraded to Phase 2 of P25, which, once again, we'll cover in a little bit on there. What it also did is it, it said we're going to establish a protocol support for encryption. So what it did was it's saying, okay, if you're going to use P25, the encryption standards have to be there. We're not just going to have every little individual company go ahead and make their own encryption standards because then what ends up happening is you're getting back to the whole purpose of creating a common air interface, of having a standard on there. So what they did is they said, okay, we're going to first of all start out with DES, which is a 56-bit key encryption, okay? DES was used, it was kind of, I think it actually kind of replaced a lot of the Motorola standard on there. Motorola used to have DVP, and it kind of went DES. That was kind of the standard for the longest time on there. Then they went and they said, okay, if you need more secure, you can go to what they call a two-key triple DES, and you can go to a three-key triple DES, what does that mean? What well, kind of stuff started going up the line um, of going on there? Now, the next one I see is actually a little typo on my PowerPoint. Excuse me. It's not AED. That's an EMS side of me, I guess. It's AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, which is a 256. Now, you hear that a lot, okay? AES 256. Now, that is supposed to be a standard. There are different versions of AES 256. But if you go with the AES-256 for P25, it is a specific type of standard on there. Now, another type of encryption that they came up with, which was part of the P25 process, was RC4, or sometimes, um, which is a 40-bit. You may know it if you're in the Motorola world as ADP. If you are an EF Johnson Kedward person, you'll hear it as called ARC4, ARC4. That is a simple 40-bit key. It is a low-level encryption on there, so it's not going to be as high as, you know, RC4 or ARC4 or ADP is lower. Then it goes to DES56. Then it goes to AES256. That's the higher order on there, okay? One thing about RC4 encryption, which has been used a lot, is while it might be a little easy to do for decoding, you still have to do a few things, but it's a software-based kind of encryption. You don't necessarily need to have a key loader to be able to do it. So just kind of keep that in mind. But once again, that created that standard, that purpose of saying, okay, if you're using a P25 compliant radio and it has encryption in there to meet the P25 standards, then this is what you're going to go ahead and use and have on there. Now, with this P25 common air interface, 
it came up and said, we're going to use some specific, excuse me, specific things at first when he came out. It was broken down into two phases. But first, it was going to start out and use FDMA, which is Frequency Division Multiple Access, okay? Where when we've talked about other things, you have two ways to slice the frequencies in digital. You have it to go down a roadway, or you have it where you have a roadway, but you're stacking cars bumper to bumper, okay? Bumper to bumper is like TDMA, just paving the roadway and just driving down that lane, that's FDMA. That's why at the beginning I wanted to give that primer again, rem kind of remembering on there. It uses C4FM, okay? So that's continuous four-level FM modulation. Very similar to actually what is in like next-end radios or Yezu System Fusion. That is a C4FM variant. System is access. Uh, system access is done with the usage of NAC. So if we think of NAC, it's kind of like a PL tone on there. We'll cover that in a little bit. And then the voice routing to who it's going to go to is done with talk groups. So that's another thing to go ahead and think about. Now, as I said, it was broken down into two phases of implementation. So instead of coming up with a completely different standard, what they did is they broke it down into. You have this part, which we're going to start out with, and then we're eventually going to phase into the next part. So phase one was for conventional-based operation. And we're going to get into more of these in a minute, but just kind of understand there. So that is going to be radio to radio. That is going to be radio into a repeater, okay, into a system. And that is going to be basic conventional system. Key up on one frequency, release, listen on another frequency, or talk around channels or radio to radio channels. It is not getting into trunking. It is not doing anything else. That works great with FDMA. Phase two was the trunking protocol basis that is now starting to roll out across different systems on there. That uses a TDMA approach, which is time division multiple access. And we're going to cover all that in a little bit here. But that's what you have to understand. Because some people are going to hear it and some people are going to use the term, oh, they're, I, you know, P25 phase one and P25 phase two and this and this and this. And then they're going to be a term P25 trunking, which we'll cover that in a little bit. Because <clears throat> there isn't really per se a P25 trunking. That's a misnomer on there. But these are your phases of p25 so in essence once again i pick up a radio i'm on a department whatever whatever and we're going to a system so the county goes to a new system and the county is saying oh it's going to be a p25 phase one system ah okay then i know i can go to any radio manufacturer and say i need a obviously for the correct band so if you're vhf vhf uhf you get what i'm saying and they're going to say yep we're going to the system and this is going to be a P25 phase one system. Okay, I know that I can go to Motorola, Kenwood, EF Johnson, Tate, um, <clears throat> whoever else, Harris. Okay, and I could say, listen, I need a P25 phase one radio in VHF band, blah, blah, blah. Then they're going to go, yep, this radio will meet that standard on there. So let's talk about the phase one, which was conventional. So it used a 12 and a half kilohertz operation. So if we go back to the beginning of the show here, remember we showed that four lane highway. So now we're utilizing two of the lanes for that traffic on there. It is what they call a single user per channel access method. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means unlike TDMA, like DMR, you have one frequency, but you could have two simultaneous conversations. That's different. In phase one, it is FDMA, like the picture shows, so that traffic is going down there. It's not a bumper to bumper. It's a straight shoot down there. It uses C4FM modulation. We've kind of already talked about that. But now we get into this thing that talks about the data rate. Now, the data rate is how fast the data is being transmitted. And in this case, it's transmitted at 4,800 4, or 4,800 baud at two bits per symbol. That's what's going to get you what they call the 9,600 baud per second, okay? That's going to get you the digital data rate. So if you were to take a look at it from the 10,000-foot view, the P25 data is being sent out at 9,600 bauds a second, all righty? For those that might be the hammy side of things, right, okay, 
APRS, that's 1,200 baud. APRS could do 9,600 baud, okay? But usually when you have higher baud rates, you have to have an infrastructure that can support it. P25 in their design says, yes, this is the structure that can do it. But the reason that you also went up in a higher baud rate at 9,600 is because as you increase your baud rate, you increase the fidelity, you increase the, the quality of that RF signal, excuse me, the voice on that RF signal. If you have more compressed, if you have like a 4,800 baud, you're going to have it more tinny, more kind of hard sounding on there, where 9,600 baud gave it better. Now, the breakdown to the 9,600 baud, it's not just pure 100% voice, okay? It's broken down. So 4,400 baud is your voice data rate. So your voice is being transmitted of that 9,600 baud, 4,400 of those data bits being transmitted are actually for your voice. Now, in addition, there's another 2,800 baud rate, which carries data for forward air correction. This is needed in order for the radios to be able to say, okay, wait a minute here, I should be receiving this packet, this is what it should be doing, these are the frames, these are the rates and everything like that on there, and that's what helps any data to make sure that, okay, wait, I'm getting a bad signal, I can kind of piece it and sort of put it together. But then in addition to that, so if you take a look at 2,800 and 4,400, that's not 9,600. We're still 2,400 short. And in this case, this is going to be for signal and other control functions. Now, this is where, like I said, each thing has its own little kind of interesting part about it. With P25, you can send text messages. Yes, you can. You can send text messages. You can send status. You can send call alerts you can send radio checks you could send call stuns you can do remote monitoring there's a bunch of data functions within the whole aspects of p25 that that 2400 baud rate needs to contain on there so as you see the high quality of digital voice is kind of coming through here 4400 bauds for just your voice alone 2,800 of that is for forward air correction, and then 2,400 of that is then for those command functions and stuff like that are on there. That doesn't need voice to do it, okay? If I want to call alert a radio, right? If I have another user, I can hit it, deet, 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 send a signal to them, and their radio could wake up and say, oh, hey, I'm being called. My radio just beeped at me. Or we can ping your radio, okay, to see it. You know, I've worked on a department where we had that ability to do that. So if a person was not answering their radios. You know, unit four, do you copy? Unit four, do you copy? We could take and hit a button that would send a ping to the radio. And what that would do is it would come back. And if we got an ACK back, whether it be on the council, whether it be in the radio itself, and we got an ACK back, then that meant, hey, that radio is turned on. They're just not listening to it. But if we didn't get an ACK back, then we would say, oh, shoot. Their radio's not turned on, or where are they at? That kind of thing. We we have no communication with them. That's what rides in that other 2,400 baud data packet. Now, the other thing about phase one on P25 is, is that it does allow you to decode CQPSK. That stands for Compatible Quadrature Phase Shift King. Now, what does that mean? Well, that kind of starts to lead into like simulcast systems on there where what you're doing is, is with C4FM, obviously, you need a consistent data rate to come in. You need that consistency of that signal to come in. If you have multiple signals coming in at the same time, like a P25 system is, C4FM might have some issues where you might have it where there's just microseconds or milliseconds of a key up and a key down time. And that's why on simulcast systems, you may be really close to the tower, but then all of a sudden you hear like, you know, unit four, oh, go ahead. Like, what was that? Why was that? Why was there that little bit on there? Well, the reason being is, is because that's, if it's set for C4 FM, the radio sitting there and it's listening for one data stream in essence in there. But CQPSK allows for that multiple signal in there. So that's why it's compatible quadrature phase shift king. It's, it's in essence kind of filtering it out. Does it make a big difference? Not really. It's going to be more system dependent, but this was one of the things that we put into the standard of phase one P25. So now we're going to talk about this myth real quick, which is phase one trunking. 
So there's no P25 phase one trunk. There wasn't a standard for that. That is phase two, which we're going to cover next. But what it did was, is you had people that went along and said, well, wait a minute, we need to have trunking, okay? We cannot do one repeater. Now, if we remember trunking what versus one repeater, so if we were to go ahead and think of, you know, we have four repeaters, right? And one might be law enforcement, one might be fire, one might be highway, one might be EMS, let's say for an example, right? Well, if one of the repeaters is tied up, well, guess what? you got to go to another repeater and how do you know that person's on the repeater and those kind of things like that where trunking links them all together and says, okay, wait a minute. We're just creating a voice path for you on this tower. You're going to go by talk groups. So we'll cover trunking. We kind of did in past some past episodes. So we're not going to rehash it. Let's stay on P25 here. But in essence, what happened here is, is that it kind of came up where they said, you know what? Motorola said, we have a technology out there called smart zone which basically says at each site of a tower, we can link repeater channels together and that will create a system, a site there. And that's gonna create a zone and you can link this tower. So this tower has four channels and this tower has four channels, this tower has four channels and that's your zone and stuff like that. That's another episode in and of itself. But what happened was, as they said, what we need to do is, is we'll use the smart zone technology because Motorola had that and they could do analog and digital with it. Well, now they said, let's do this and we'll call it P25 trunking and we'll use that. But instead of using our proprietary digital, we're just going to go ahead and put P25 in there. Okay. And that is kind of a lot of the common quote unquote P25 trunking systems that are out there. What is it? It's basically what you see on the screen here. You have four repeaters, <clears throat> four different frequencies. Only one conversation or one repeater can be used at one time. So what happens is that you have a control channel. So in this case, the top one, and I use some like, you know, frequencies like, you know, just UHF of the public safety band. So 472, 472 megahertz, that's going to be your control channel. And what's going to happen is when you turn your radio on to the system, it's going to call it to the control channel and say, hey, how you doing? What's going on? I'm this radio. Can I be on your system? Can I do this? this, this, this? And control channel is going to respond back and say, yes, you can or no, you can't or whatever the case may be. Then when you take your radio and you, you key up, what's going to happen then is, is that it's going to call to the control channel saying, hi, I'm this radio. I'm on your tower. Can I use it? Radio is going to say yes, and you're going to, and the radio is going to, your radio is going to say, I need to use this talk group. Do you have an open channel? The system is going to say, yep, use voice channel one or voice channel two or voice channel three, whatever you want. And then the radio is going to be told to go to that frequency, and then it's going to automatically switch on you, and then that is when you get your chirp. So you're going to be like, and that's how quick it takes. Okay, then that voice communication takes place. So that is, in essence, the trunking used as P25 phase one trunking, but it's not really a standard, okay? Motorola has adopted it. They've used it. A lot of the systems going in are that. A lot of the other manufacturers have adopted it also too, but it's not as set and as a standard or anything like that whatsoever. So big thing to see about it because, like I said, I see it a lot, especially in scanners. Oh, this can do, you know, P25 phase one and phase one trunking. No, 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 there's no phase one trunking. It's just phase one and it's kind of grouped in together there. But phase two of the standard is that, is trunking. Now, what happened in this standard is, is they were initially looking at using FDMA again, but using a trunked format like we sort of just talked about, but kind of coming up with the standard of it. Well, the one thing they found out was is that one of the reasons you go to trunking is, is to have a expandable, flexible system and channel capacity, all right? So once again, if we have four repeaters and one's PD, one's law, or one's law enforcement, one fire, one EMS, one, let's say, highway public works, right? Okay, that's there, but if public works is tied up, once again, they can't use the law enforcement one and vice versa and everything. Okay, trunking, we got it, right? But what happened was is that they said, well, if we went control channel trunking and we used FDMA, we're still kind of limiting ourselves in regards to voice capacity, right? 
So now we went from four repeaters. Now at the trunking thing, you saw one was a control channel. So that control channel is 24 seven. If you were to have a scanner, it's just gonna be bah. That's all you're gonna hear on that channel because that's the control channel calling out saying, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, wait a minute, this radio. Hey, I'm here. Yes, radio, you can do that. I'm here, I'm here. Okay, this radio, you can do that. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. That's why a lot of scanners have quote unquote control channel trunking. All righty. But if you look at FDMA, FDMA is the pathway. It's not time slots. It's not bumper to bumper. So that's where they said, no, 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 no. If we're going to do this, we need to have better flexibility. So what if we have a three channel conventional system? Okay. Is it a sample? And let's say we have police, we have fire and EMS, and let's say we have our public works. Okay. Well, once again, we have three channels. Well, if we trunk them with using phase one trunking, well, we actually just took one channel out of the mix. Plus, we can only have two conversations at one time on there, right? Because one's a control channel. We can't use that. The other two are only the open voice channels. So FDMA was said, nah, we don't want to use FDMA. We want to use TDMA. So they went with TDMA. Now, what the happens with TDMA is what you see on this picture here which is in essence, it divides each of the channels to have two time slots. So each of the repeaters, I should say, should have two time slots. So instead of having one voice channel per repeater and then one of them being control channel, now in essence, you had two voice paths on there. And in essence, one repeater was not, for FDMA, was one channel or one user. Now using with a standard one repeater is now two users at one time. So now a three-channel system just became a six-channel system. And with the control channel, you've now gained still capacity. So on our example here, you see we have one, two, three. Yes, each one has it. So in essence, this has six channel slots. We're going to say it that way. But if one is going to be the control channel, well, that still leaves five channel paths open or five talk paths, as sometimes people say it on there. So even with the control channel going to a phase two trunked confirmed system, you've just gained on a three channel to FDMA. You've gained it as a five voice path TDMA system. Now to do T to do phase two trunking, you uh, your radios do need the AMB plus two vocoder. Okay. That's where it kind of got a little bit here with that standard. So you do need the increased vo vo vocoder on there. Um, so that is kind of a take back on there, but if you take a look at it, pretty much all the radios that have been released within the last five years, at least me, you know, easily five years, they've all been the AMBE2 chip and a lot of them can be upgraded. So if you have a radio that has an AMBE, AMBE plus two chip in it right now, and you're only on P25 phase one, not phase one trunk, but maybe you are that too you can be using your AMBE plus two chip without an issue. But if we go to phase two trunking, then you need that AMBE plus two chip. Now, why do you need that? Because this is kind of the super cool part. The phase two standard, which I didn't list in here, but it is, is, is that phase two standards of systems <clears throat> that are capable actually can operate in a TDMA format, but... If you have people who are slowly migrating over, you can have them operate FDMA on some of those channels. So in other words, let's look at an example here. Let's say up on the system here, you do have some phase one users on there. So you can have these two channels in the system carved out for TDMA usage, but then um, at phase one usage, FDMA users would just go on this channel would be one. Now, this is probably going to be in a more tier, higher tiered system. So like a five channel, 10 channel, 15 channel system, right? Okay. Where it's going to have multiple things that they can carve out a few of those channels. And then in this case, when you turn on your radio, what's going to happen is, is the radio is going to say, okay, wait a minute here. You, you are a, you are a phase one, an FDMA radio on the system. You are only going to be able to use these certain channels, locations and spots on there. Your TDMA Well, then you can use these channel spots on there too. Now, it's important to note here, phase one and phase two, P25 is a digital standard. There is no analog standards in there. 
the radio may be capable of analog, but in that case, that's like a feature set of the radio. It's not designed into this protocol. <clears throat> and that's the biggest thing that you need to understand and you need to use with that on there. That's that's kind of what it is because I hear so many people say, and I've heard this, well, you know, when we got on fire scenes and stuff like that, our system is digital or our law enforcement channel is digital, but then law enforcement gets on scene and they might go to attack channel, fire may get on scene or EMS gets on scene and they go to attack channel and it's an analog channel. Oh, that's part of standard? No, that's not. That's just that's just programming of the radio on there. Now, let's talk about NACs and talk groups for a moment here, okay? This is this is prevalent in both phase one and phase two systems. So first of all, you got to understand what a NAC is. A NAC is a network access code. We kind of talked about that uh, there. Once again, think of it as like a PL tone. Remember, PL and DPL tones are sine waves, okay? Whether it be a curved or there be a, a square sine wave, okay? But they are sine waves. You can inject a sine wave into ones and zeros. So this is where the NACs kind of take place. Now the NACs is, NAC is a three-digit hex format. What that means, it's a three-digit code in a hexadecimal format. So basically 0 through 9 and A through F. With this three-digit hex format, it gives you 4,096 different combinations because you can have 000, 001, 002, 003, and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. Okay, But with that being said, there are some things to NACs that you need to understand. The biggest thing on a NAC is, is 000 is not carrier squelch, it's not turned off. 000 is actually a NAC. What they did is, is that when you have NAC F7E, <clears throat> and I don't know where they came up with this or how they came up with this, it's just part of the protocol. F7E is, in essence, like a NAC turned off. Okay, that's what it is. It's NAC is turned off. It's like carrier squelch. It's like like no PL tone, okay? So that means anybody that's talking on the frequency, matching your frequency, talk group, everything like that, you're going to hear them. Or you're going to be transmitting so it's not going to access the system. Example, if you have a PL tone of 110.9, right? Your repeater has 110.9. You need to turn on 110.9 in your radio in order to be able to talk into the repeater or the system. Same thing. NAC F7E would be like, okay, I'm just transmitting nothing in there, but maybe this NAC is 100 or whatever the case may be. You would turn on or program in NAC 100, and then you're going to go ahead and transmit into the system. Now, for repeaters, okay, so like if you have a repeater that could be set to carrier squelch, no PL tone for receive on there, then the repeater has to be set to F7F, and that's going to be for the repeater. So that means the repeater is going to be able to be accessed whether you have a NAC code in there or not. Now, one of the strange things about it is, is the NAC code 293, that kind of became the default standard on there. And what you're going to see is a lot of people are going to argue with it. So they're going to say NAC 293 is the equivalent of like CTCSS Tone 67. And it's not really holding true per se so some people say that and then they, you go up there so you know uh 67.0 69.3 someone's saying okay 67 is 293 69.3 would actually be 294 and 295 and 296 now that that really didn't translate over that well on there you are also going to go ahead and hear people that are going to say that the proper way to translate nax to pl is to just go ahead and take what the tone is. So if you had tone 67.0 hertz for a PL tone, well, the NAC code would be 67. And if it's 69.3 hertz for a PL tone, it would be NAC 69. And, you know, 100 hertz would be NAC 100. And 110.9 hertz, you know, that kind of thing. So you get it. There is no correlation between the two. There isn't whatsoever. Once again, you have 4,096 combos, so you're not really going to have that many issues on there. Now, the interesting thing about NACs, which is just like PL or DPL tones, is you can split it for transmit and to receive. So you could transmit on, say, <clears throat> NAC, um, NAC 293 and then receive on your radio on F7E, so there's no receive code. Or some systems back early in the day 
were knack steered for P25. And what knack steering meant was is that you keyed up and based on what knack you were using determined which transmitters or sites you went out to. So an example, you had, let's say, a five, five, uh, five site radio system. OK, and if you wanted to go into site one, you would use one knack. If you wanted to go into site two, you would use the second one. If you want to go in three, four, five, that kind of thing like that on there. So there was that kind of ability that had it in there for the knack. So that's kind of what it was. And it can be split like that. But now not to get knack confused, we're going to talk about talk groups and talk groups in this case are a little different. NAC is your access to the system. That's your access signaling access. That's going to open up the repeater. That's going to open up the other radios. Talk groups in this case is the way that they go ahead and steer your voice path down the system. So let's talk about this real quick and then I'll get to it. Okay. So much like you could do NAC codes in hexadecimal, you can do it in decimal, but most people just keep it in hex format. Okay. Now with talk groups though, you'll see a big left twix, right twix kind of thing of hex format versus decimal format. So in hex format, you have talk groups zero through, actually zero, 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 but zero through FFFF. That's the highest talk group you can have. What does that translate to? Well, that translates to talk groups basically one through 65,534. Now, wait a minute. On the screen, John, it says 535. Is that a typo? No, and I'll tell you why in a minute. So it's 1 through 6, 65,534. Now, why did I not count 535? Well, because 535 as part of the protocol is an all call. So if you were to transmit on your radio on 65,535 or hex for FFFF, doesn't matter what the other users talk groups are in their radio, you are going to talk open up their radios with that talk group. Okay. This is lots of times dispatch may do this kind of thing and stuff like that on there. There's different applications and different purposes. So let me give you an example of where this would be. Okay. So where this might be is in a, um, a trunk radio system or even conventional radio systems if they're really smart on there. What happens in this case is, is that maybe your main talk group, which a lot of places default to talk group one. Okay. But let's say there's a lieutenant channel or an admin channel or something like that where ranking officials need to talk to one another. And let's say your channel's not that busy. So what can happen is, is that you might be normal dispatch, everything might be on talk group one. But then if I, as a supervisor, need to talk to another supervisor, I change a channel, my radio. Now, let's say I'm on talk group two. Now, only people using talk group two would be the supervisors. So now I pick up my radio and I talk and now I'm using talk group two. The users of talk group one are not going to hear my radio transmission, but talk group two users are going to hear it on that second channel. Okay. That is kind of that aspect of why you would use it. It basically routes the voice on there. Now, in a trunking system, it's the same thing. It's talk groups, which if you're familiar with trunking, that's what it is. Okay, I key up the system I want to talk to. <clears throat> I'm talking to dispatch on our main channel. Okay, let's say talk group two is our tactical on-scene channel. When a trunk system, that doesn't really make a big difference on there. Now, where would this all-call talk group come into play? Okay, so let's say we have a event going on and we have users that are doing the normal daily users, they're on talk group one. And let's say you have a special team that's to event, whether it's a concert, a public safety event, whatever, whatever the case may be, you have some other users that are going to be on talk group two, which is one of the tactical channels or events channels. And then let's say, for example, you have fire and they're maybe on normal day-to-day -day usage. Maybe they're on talk group 10. And then EMS is on their talk group and their talk group 11. Now, Let's say there is a bad storm coming or dispatch has to put out a message or an all points bulletin or something like that on there. Well, dispatch isn't going to go and go on talk group one and then on talk group two and then on talk group 10 and then talk group 11. That's where the all call talk group can come in. Dispatch can hit that button and it doesn't even need to be dispatch. You can actually program that into 
your radios, okay? On my commercial side of things for P25 users and DMR and everything, there's an all-call talk group, and I have that to announce when I'm actually doing stuff on the system, right? Or work might be done or whatever the case. So going back to our scenario, dispatch just hits the all-call talk group, and then what it does is it keys up all the talk groups at once. So it's going to key up talk group 1, talk group 2, talk group 10, talk group 11, and now your message is going to come across. So dispatch can say, you know, all units be advised. The National Weather Service has said we have a severe weather we have severe weather coming into the area right now um keep an eye to the sky on there and uh shelter in place or whatever whatever the announcement needs to be all points bolton whatever case may be that's how the all call talk group would work now remember talk groups work within a conventional channel well on phase one whether it just be radio to radio or repeated channel and then it also works on phase two with trunking or phase one trunking on there so that is really kind of it dealing with the aspects of P25 on there. But it comes to this time of the show where you don't really bends my antenna. You know what really bends my antenna is the stigmata and problems that P25 has really sort of come into and endured or gone through. And what I mean by that is, is I mean that P25 is always being viewed as this upper tier, upper echelon form of digital voice format that is public safety only. And if you're not a rich man, you can't use P25. Well, that is BS, okay? P25 uses vocoders. Vocoders, in this case, are have a patent by DVSI. Okay, though it's not proprietary. I'll get into that in one second. But to purchase the vocoder, it's going to go ahead and cost you money to do it. And who is P25 sold by? P25 is sold by commercial dealers, manufacturers, right? Motorola, E.F. Johnson, Kenwood, right? They can put a high price tag on there. It helps offset the cost of what they have for manufacturing. But DVSI encoders do cost money. And that's the name of the game, folks. Okay. When I hear people complain about, you know, needing to buy the vocoder for P25, I say, you know what? It's no different than going ahead and buying a vehicle, right? If we're to translate a vehicle, if I want to buy a car that does basic car things, guess what? I could buy that basic car. But if I want to buy a truck that's got to have a huge super engine and, and all this kind of stuff, because I need tow trailers and stuff like that, guess what? You're going to be paying more for it, right? Are there other trucks out there that can kind of sort of do the job? Well, yeah, but not what I needed to do. So you see what I'm saying is, is that there is a trade-off to it. So that's that's unfortunately going to be the, the, the sad part about it is, and there's no way to get around that in any way, shape, or form, okay? Now, another thing with that comes down to the, quote, proprietariness of digital voice modes. Well, first of all, I'm going to go ahead and say no digital voice mode is proprietary. None. Finito. They're not. Okay. P25. It is a standard published common air interface. DMR. It is an Etsy standard. Nexten is an, a standard. Okay. Fusion is a standard. Okay. DSAR is a standard. They're all standards that are out there. But just because you need certain equipment to do it, <clears throat> to make it easier to use, let's put it that way, does not make it a proprietary technology. In addition, I brought it up earlier. Someone went along and they said, oh, P25 is made and only by Motorola. You are wrong, my friend. Put that on your billboard, okay? You are wrong. P25, yes, was jumped on quickly by Motorola. Motorola has always been somewhat of a pioneer when it comes to communications. They had the format for trunking different formats. In essence, once again, like we said, phase one trunking is kind of a Motorola format. Alrighty, they jumped on the bandwagon first. Doesn't mean that it is only their technology. No, <clears throat> as I said, you have Motorola, you have EF Johnson, you have Kenwood, you have Tate, you have Harris, and I'm sure there's other modes, other probably P25 things that are out there that have come and gone. RCA had one even. Yes, RCA made radios, and, and I'm not sure they're still in business or not, but RCA and, and other ones, they had them all out there, and they were all P25. They met that standard, okay? 
but you're going to pay more for it. But does that mean P25 is not ascertainable to be used for other modes? No, it's not. It is not. As <clears throat> technology advances more and more and more, used radios come to the market, okay? And to be honest with you, many dealers are starting to wake up and realize that, you know what? If we want to keep this customer, don't make them buy a radio or some feature that they don't need now. Buy or have them add the feature later. You can flash upgrade Motorola radios. You can flash upgrade EF Johnson radios. You can flash upgrade Kenwood radios. You can. It, it, it's all capable on there, all righty? It's just going to go ahead and come down to what you want to spend. Now, yes, is the radio going to be charging a little bit more? Are you going to be able to pay Baofeng prices for a P25 radio? No, and if you think that, stop. Okay, stop. Not everything's going to be a Baofeng price. All righty. But with that being said, is, is that P25 is attainable. All righty. And it is fun to use. It really is fun to use. It has high voice quality. Okay. It is actually easier to program than, in essence, other modes. Okay. I will say P25 versus DMR is a lot easier to program. All I need to know is really my knack. Most people use Talk Group 1. It's people that want to get more granular for certain purposes that you really have to then kind of learn about it. But once again, it's a frequency, a knack, and a Talk Group. That's it. Nine times out of ten, that Talk Group is going to be number one. And nine times out of ten, you're going to be using NAC 293. I live near P25 repeaters on VHF and on UHF. And I know of P25 repeater networked, uh, networks together. I love it. High quality voice on there. There is. I use it on a daily basis. That's why public safety chose it. That's why that standard came out. That's why it has a 4,400 bit rate for voice in a 9,600 baud data stream. Okay. Because it can do a lot of great things on there. I tell people if they're saying, hey, I want a digital voice technology, but I don't want to use a digital voice designed for amateur. Okay, cool. What do they say? What's your next one? And people will get floored because I'll go ahead and I'll say P25. Or they'll be like, you think I made a money? No. I never said that. Well, but how am I going to afford that? I can go buy a DMR, a high quality DMR. We're not talking this Balfang crap now. Okay, I can go buy a high quality DMR radio for $300, $400. Yeah, and depending on what you want to do, you can go ahead and buy a P25 radio and a handheld in this case, what we're talking about, for half that price. Now, there is a drawback to P25 if you're using it, and that is usually that you need to have programming software and cables for it. That is always, always, always a conundrum when it comes to these kind of things, okay? Cables are becoming more affordable. You can go online and find reputable places that sell aftermarket cables that do work okay. Software is a little more difficult. Software usually comes with the big tag on there, okay? Motorola knows, EF Johnson knows, Kenwood knows. They all know that if you're going to go ahead and you're going to buy radios, you want to program them, you got to buy the software. And software can one, one software program can program infinite amount of radios as long as that software meets that make and model. So they're not going to go ahead and charge you 15 bucks for it. They're going to go ahead and charge you $350, $500 just for you to have that one-time purchase of software because you're going to go ahead and do it. And the best part is they're going to go ahead and only charge you and have that license for X amount of years, maybe three years or five years. And then when the firmwares come out and the new updates come out or new radios come out, even if the same model okay, come out, they may have the newer firmware update and it won't. your radio won't read or program it. Guess what you got to do? You got to fork over more money to get it. If anything, that's the one drawback of P25. Once again, you can get handhelds and radios for $150, $200, $250. If you want to be multi-mode, yeah, you're going to be paying a little more money, but then you have that in that, that, I don't even say arsenal to you. But if I'm going to say this, P25 is not some sort of elitist kind of voice, digital voice format. You'd be surprised at how many people actually are out there using P25 and they don't really go ahead and say on it. I'm a big fan of P25, not just because I use it in a public safety or a commercial setting, but I also like to use it in the amateur setting. So don't think that that's on there, but also don't be afraid of it. That's probably one of the biggest things that I go ahead and see there.
And that's this week's, you know what really bends my antenna? Well, thank you very much for going ahead and tuning in about P25 here. I hope it really kind of brought forth that standard of what it is and it's on there. Thank you for everyone that tuned in. We are working on some of the other episodes too for hopefully doing some of the other digital modes, but they do take time and research and everything like that. So until then, I want everybody to stay safe. The weather's getting better slowly, little by little. I know some places don't seem like it, but it is. Stay safe. Take care. If you got some great new cigars, sit back and enjoy them and stay safe, everybody.